friends, we've been working through the book of Acts, uh, and so you might want to turn uh, up chapter 4 uh, in your Bibles or uh, Google it on your cell phones. But if you were here last week, you might remember that we left Peter and John, the two apostles of Jesus, sitting in jail. They had been locked up for the night for causing a public disturbance after a cripple had been miraculously healed at the temple in Jerusalem. The two apostles claimed that they had nothing to do with the healing, and they put the blame on their friend Jesus, which was an astonishing thing to do, as Jesus had been publicly executed in that city two months earlier. So basically, they're blaming a dead guy. You would have thought that being dead was quite a good defense. Where were you when the cripple was healed? Well, your honor, I was dead. That's quite a good alibi, don't you think? But according to Peter and hundreds of other eyewitnesses, Jesus, in fact, was not dead. Instead, he had risen from the dead and appeared in public many times over a period of 40 days. And hundreds of people who had seen him and heard him in those 40 days were willing to testify to the fact. As you can imagine, the healing of the well-known beggar had caused quite a stir. And people ran from far and wide, we read last week, to see if the rumors were true. Well, let's pick up the story now as Peter and John get themselves arrested. I'm going to ask Rob and Sue to bring our reading for this morning. Good morning, church. Our reading comes from uh, Acts chapter 4, verses 1 to 14. Hear the word of the Lord. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John. While they were speaking to the people, they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Christ the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the numbers of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or, power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man, who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, they know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. We continue at verse 15. Yeah. So they ordered them, to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then confer together. What are we going to do with these men? They asked. <clears throat> Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign. and We cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, what, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, <clears throat> we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go they could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed 
was over 40 years old. May God bless the reading of his word. Thank you. Well, friends, I've entitled our sermon this morning, No Other Name. There is no other name under heaven by which you may be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. Well, the Bible says that Christians should always be ready to share the reason for the hope that they have, which means that we should take every opportunity to share the gospel uh, that we can. But it's not always easy to share our faith, is it? I don't know if it's just me, but uh, I get quite, quite nervous when I realize that actually now would be a good time to tell someone about Jesus. Many of our friends and family are skeptical or cynical about Jesus' claims that he is God in the flesh and that we should worship him. Others are just plain hostile to anything that has to do with Jesus or the church. So it's not always easy to share the gospel. But if we're going to take the opportunities that come our way to speak about Jesus, we are going to need both courage and conviction. And in our passage today, we see both courage and conviction at work. Courage, because Peter and John are speaking in one of the most hostile environments imaginable. And conviction, because they're up against the most skeptical, cynical, and anti-Jesus audience imaginable. Jesus' last words to Peter and John were that they should be his witnesses, starting in Jerusalem. And as Peter and John face their accusers in Jerusalem, the question is whether they are going to have the courage and conviction to stand firm and witness to who Jesus really is. And so there are actually more than one trial going on in this passage, uh, as we will see. Of course, the physical trial is the apostles' trial before the high priest, the high priest uh, and the Sanhedrin. But of course, they're on trial before Jesus himself. Will they stand for him or won't? And then, as we will see later, there's actually a third trial going on in the background. But in our passage today, we discover where we too can find courage and conviction to witness to the truth about Jesus. So let's look at our passage. In the first half of the story, Peter and John witness about Jesus at their trial. Have a look at verse 5. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Down in verse 15, we read that these rulers, elders, and teachers of the law were actually the different members of a group called the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin were the, was the Jewish supreme ruling council of the day. And they also acted as the Jewish court of justice. And the Sanhedrin ran the province of Judea under the watchful eye of the Roman emperor, emperor, empire and the emperor. This council, the Sanhedrin, was made up of 70 Jewish rulers and the high priest, 71 in all. All the top dogs of Jewish religious and public life. And they had the power to pretty much do anything they wanted except executions. And that's why they had to send Jesus to Pilate, because they weren't allowed to pass the death penalty. But actually, they could do anything else. They ran the place. You might remember that Nicodemus uh, from John 3 and Joseph of Arimathea, who gave his tomb for Jesus to be buried. And those two men were both members of the Sanhedrin themselves, and they became Christians eventually. Some people say that the Apostle Paul was possibly part of these 70 ruling elders as well. Well, Peter and John are sitting in jail that night, but while they're sitting there, the cell phones in Jerusalem are going crazy because the Sanhedrin are being called to assemble early the next morning for a trial. In verse 6, in typical Luke fashion, we're given the actual names of some of the more prominent members of the Sanhedrin. We're told that Annas, the high priest, was there, and so was Caiaphas, as well as John, Alexander, and others of the high priest family. Now, some of those names should be sending shivers down your spine if you know your Bibles. Because back in Matthew tw chapter 26, uh, when we're getting close to uh, the end of Jesus' life, we read that these same people had met two months earlier in Caiaphas' palace on Spy Wednesday, 
as we call it, the Wednesday before Jesus was murdered, to come up with a plan to arrest Jesus and have him killed. Go and read that for yourself in Matthew 26. And after Jesus is arrested, uh, after the Last Supper, they take him to none other than Annas, to this Annas that we read about here, for his first trial. Annas then sends Jesus to the high priest, Caiaphas, and there's a preliminary hearing with some of the elders, so that's Jesus' second trial. Then Caiaphas assembles the full Sanhedrin for a full religious trial at dawn on Good Friday, uh, and, and that's Jesus' third trial. That's the Sanhedrin. Well, Jesus is found guilty of blasphemy by the Sanhedrin, and they send him to Pilate, and that's his fourth trial of the morning. And Pilate sends him to Herod for another trial. And Herod sends him back to Pilate for another trial. That's six trials or six hearings in one night. And it all ends up with Pilate twice saying, I find no grounds in Jesus for the death penalty. And that's when Jesus faces his seventh and final trial. Of course, the kangaroo court with the crowds baying for his blood and insisting that Jesus be executed, which Pilate finally agrees to. And by nine o'clock in the morning, Jesus is hanging on a cross outside Jerusalem. Seven trials Jesus went through, each one finding that he was innocent. And it all started with these same guys that Peter and John are now facing a few weeks later. Same courtroom, same high priest, same Sanhedrin. And you might also remember that Peter had also been at Jesus' trial uh, before that Sanhedrin, not inside the courtroom, but you remember, outside, listening through a window. And you might remember that on that occasion, a young servant girl frightened Peter half to death when she recognized him. And Peter ends up denying Jesus three times. Do you remember? In Matthew's gospel, we read, Peter began to curse and he swore with an oath. I do not know the man. So the question is, if Peter denied Jesus three times when he was outside the courtroom, will Peter deny Jesus again now that he is inside the courtroom, on trial, just as Jesus had been? This could easily have been Peter and John's last day working, walking on this earth. This same Sanhedrin had plotted and lied and bribed witnesses to get Jesus killed. And they're more than capable of doing the same thing again. And in verse 7, they ask the apostles a key question. We read, they had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or by what name did you do this? Did you heal this, uh, this beggar, this cripple? So Peter and John's lives literally de depend on their answer. What are they going to do? They had both already abandoned Jesus once to save their skins when he was executed. What, are, what is going to stop them from abandoning Jesus again? Where are they going to find that courage and conviction to stand firm this time? And the answer is there in verse 8. We read, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, answered them. You see, this is a different Peter to the one who had denied Jesus. Not, not a literally different Peter, same man, but quite a different story this time. You see, Jesus' trial had taken place before Pentecost. But this trial takes place, well, after Pentecost. After Jesus has given his apostles his spirit to give them courage and enable them to speak the gospel to the Jews. And Jesus doesn't only give apostles like Peter and John courage and ability to speak the gospel. No, he gives the Holy Spirit to all his people to equip us to tell our friends and family and neighbors and colleagues how God has shown his love for them on the cross. You see, it's the Holy Spirit who has changed the apostles from being quivering wrecks to being people who are willing to speak out for Christ. And that's what happens in the rest of the chapter. Now, a slight side road. The word filled in verse 8, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. That word filled can be misleading. It might make you think that Christians are only filled with the Holy Spirit at certain times. 
or that over time your holy spirit level can start dropping a bit like my jojo tank a bit like your solar your solar battery that it drops down 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 and then it needs a topping up every now and again well friends the rest of the bible makes it very clear that that doesn't happen nor can it happen that just simply can't happen because the holy spirit is a person He's not a power or a force or a source of energy out there. He is a person as much as you are. You see, when you become a Christian, the Bible says you are filled with the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, comes and takes up residence in you. And so if you're a Christian, the question is not, have you been filled with the Spirit? The question is, are you complying and cooperating with the Holy Spirit who is in you? You see, it is possible for Christians to quench and suppress and stifle and resist and ignore and defy and even disobey and grieve the Holy Spirit with whom God has filled you with. But the one thing you cannot be is not filled with the Holy Spirit. If you are a Christian and here Peter strengthened and inspired and compelled by the Holy Spirit, he speaks up for Christ and he begins by saying, did you really arrest us for being kind to a crippled beggar? I didn't know there was a law against being kind to crippled beggars. He really is, is mocking them. He's saying how stupid it is that you put us on trial for this. And then Peter goes on and actually he could have just said, you know, you asked who healed the man, God healed the man. And actually, Peter would have been telling the truth, and, and that answer would have been quite acceptable to the Sanhedrin. Of course, God had healed the man who had been a cripple from birth. Who else could have done it? You see, it's easy to talk in general terms about, well, God out there. And you won't really offend many people if you do that. But Peter is not intimidated by this counsel because he has been strengthened, remember, by the Holy Spirit. And so he says, if you're looking for someone to pin this on, well, let me be specific. Let me give you the name of the person who healed this man. He was Jesus Christ of Nazareth who healed the cripple. You've arrested the wrong guys. You should have arrested Jesus because Jesus healed this man that you see standing before you this day. Look at verse 9. Peter first mocks them. If we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who is lame, he says, well, how stupid would that be? And if, you are, and, and if we are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed now it's not some sort of there's not some sort of magical power in the name of jesus you know it's not like the name of voldemort in the harry potter series the name that may not be mentioned because there's power in the name there's no power in the name of jesus but it's what the name of jesus represents that is powerful it's a bit like an ambassador who operates in the name of their president you know, I can go and knock on the door of the union buildings in Pretoria and ask to see Uncle Cyril. Uh, and I hopefully someone will ask me who I think I am. But if I say, you know, I'm Andy Park from Howick, well, I'm probably going to be waiting at the, at the back of a very long queue. But if I say I'm coming in the name of the president of Morocco, or I'm coming in the name of the president of the DRC, well, it'll be quite a different story. I'm sure I'll be offered a cup of tea and ushered in at the first opportunity. You see, using someone's name means you represent them. And Peter is saying that he comes in the name of the most important and the most powerful man in the universe, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the one who rules heaven and earth. And once again, Peter could actually have left the whole matter right there. He had answered their question. He had even had the guts to mention the name of Jesus. But Peter's still not done yet. You see, he's not interested in just being get, getting out of prison and going home. No, he cares about God, and truth is important to God, and so Peter tells the truth. But actually, he cares about people too. And he wants these people, these men of the Sanhedrin, 
to understand who Jesus is because they matter to God. He wants these men to be saved. And so they need to know why God is angry with them. You're never going to ask Jesus for forgiveness until you've understood what you need forgiveness for. And so Peter reminds them, doesn't he? You crucified Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ. Verse 11, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. The person they had killed was none other than God's king, God's son, their Messiah. And God confirmed that Jesus was indeed his king by raising him from the dead. And Peter says, it is this resurrected Jesus who has healed the cripple. Could it be, could it be that you need to be reminded that the Jesus that you've ignored, the Jesus that you consider irrelevant to your life, is none other than God's son, God's king, who came to die for you? Could it be that you need to ask him for forgiveness for ignoring him? for maybe treating him as though he were dead. Well, Peter goes on, and he tells them that they've made a dreadful mistake. Look at verse 11. And in verse 11, Peter is actually quoting Psalm 118, the psalm we began our service with this morning. Jesus, says Peter, Jesus is the corner you build, sorry, the stone you build is rejected, which has become the cornerstone. The stone you build is rejected has now become the cornerstone. Basically, Peter says, the man you rejected has now become the most important person in the whole universe. You know, before they invented theodolites and other clever things, the cornerstone was always the stone that the builders laid first. The rest of the building was pegged out and built on that stone. It was vital that that stone was put down in the right place and aligned correctly so that the rest of the building could take shape around it. And Peter says that the stone uh, that the builders rejected, the, the stone that the Jews chucked out, is actually the stone that God has salvaged and is now building his kingdom on. Peter goes on, as I said, to quote Psalm 118, because in Psalm 118, David was also under pressure, like Jesus had been. The nations were against David, even his own people were against David in Psalm 118. But God rescued David and used him to establish the kingdom of Israel. But of course, as with so many of David's Psalms, David is actually foretelling what will happen to Jesus, the greater David, the greater king over the greater kingdom of God. Just as David was rejected and surrounded by his enemies within Israel, so Jesus uh, was rejected and surrounded by enemies within Israel. Just as they tried to take out David, so they tried to take out Jesus. Just as God rescued David, so God rescued Jesus from the dead and raised him back to life. Just as God installed David over the kingdom, so he has now installed Jesus over the kingdom of the universe. Jesus is the greater David. And so Peter says, Jesus is the stone that you builders rejected, but the stone which has now become the cornerstone of the kingdom of God. Imagine that. Peter is saying, not only did you kill God's son, not only did you kill God's king, God has raised his king from the dead and now made him the cornerstone of the kingdom. The entire kingdom of God is now built on the man you killed. So surely, surely this Sanhedrin is doomed. Surely God is going to come after them and get them for what they did to Jesus. Can you imagine being in a worse situation than being a member of the Sanhedrin who got Jesus killed? But Peter doesn't leave it there. Look at verse 12. He says to the Sanhedrin, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Now, Peter is actually saying two things here, negatively and positively. Negatively, he's saying that there is no way to get to heaven apart from Jesus. 
apart from acknowledging and submitting to the king of heaven. Now, that has never been a very popular thing to say, not in Peter's day and not in our day either. But if it's the truth, then it's actually a loving thing to say, because it means that even people like this Jewish Sanhedrin can be saved. And if there's still hope for people who murdered Jesus, well, then surely there's hope for you and there's hope for me, no matter how much we have sinned against God. As long as we acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord and we worship him as such, because, to restate Peter's words now positively, salvation can be found in Christ. For there is a name under heaven given to mankind by which we can be saved even if you are a member of the Sanhedrin. So God has provided us with a way to be saved, and he has made it easy. We just have to take on the name of Jesus Christ as our Lord and our God. And so have you, will you, take on the name of Jesus Christ as your God? <clears throat> Well, let's see how the Sanhedrin respond, because Peter and John aren't the only ones who were on trial that day. Without realizing it, the Sanhedrin are also on trial. But for them, Jesus is their judge, watching to see what they will do. And so the religious leaders sadly reject Jesus at their trial. <clears throat> Look at verse 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So the, San, San, the Sanhedrin are astonished. Here are these unschooled fishermen from Galilee, of all places, who are sticking to their guns and insisting that Jesus is alive. And that God has enthroned Jesus. And that is this living, and that this living enthroned Jesus is the one who healed the cripple. And the Sanhedrin can't deny it because the man who had been healed is standing right there in front of them. The man is living proof that what the apostles are saying is actually true. And so, verse 15 the Sanhedrin ordered Peter and John to withdraw from the Sanhedrin, and then they conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. You see, the religious leaders can't deny that this has actually happened. And they're finding it very hard not to agree with the apostles, that Jesus must have indeed been the one who healed the man. And so they do the next best thing, and they issue a gag order. Verse 18, they called them in again, and they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. It reminds me of the story of Christostom, John Christostom, who was the Archbishop of Constantinople, today's Istanbul, uh, which in those days was the capital of the Roman Empire. Christostom uh, was the leader of the church. In that, in that city, and he was hauled in front of the emperor, uh, Arcadius and his wife, Eudoxia. Wonderful names. Why don't we call our kids Arcadius and Eudoxia anymore? But the emperor, Arcadius, the most powerful man in the universe, all in the world, and who thought he was God, and his wife both hated Christostom because of what he taught about Jesus. And the emperor says to Christostom, unless you stop your speaking, we will banish you. Christostom replied, you cannot banish me. The whole world belongs to God, my father. So where are you going to banish me to? Arcadia said, we will then execute you. Christostom said, you cannot, for my life is hidden in Jesus Christ, and I will live forever if you execute me. Arcadia said, we will then take away your property. And he said, you cannot. My treasure is in heaven and my heart is there. Eudoxia then pops up, the emperor's wife. We will put you in solitary confinement and leave you miserable. He answered, you cannot, for I have a divine friend from whom you can never separate me. And so Christostom ended off saying, emperor, I defy you. There is nothing you can do to hurt me. But friends, what do you do with a man like that? How irritating is he? 
What do you do with people like Peter and John? What do you do with Christians whose boldness comes from knowing the name of the risen king who reigns over the world? Peter and John call on these great men of the Sanhedrin to repent and put their trust in Jesus Christ of Nazareth, but they reject the offer of forgiveness and salvation, and instead they try and stop anyone else from being forgiven and saved. Verse 18, they called them in and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Why did they reject God's offer of forgiveness and salvation? Why did they prefer to remain guilty rather than being saved and made righteous by God? I think partly it's because they would have to have eaten humble pie and admitted that they'd been completely wrong about the Jesus that they had killed. Partly it's because they stood to lose power and money and social standing in the community if they joined the Christians. And so they dig their heels in and they refuse to be forgiven. They refuse to align themselves with the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You see, you do have to eat humble pie in order to become a Christian. You do need to admit that you've offended God by breaking his law and by ignoring Jesus, maybe even using Jesus' name as a swear word. You do need to admit that your good works can't erase your sins. And you do need to admit that forgiveness is the only way anyone is ever going to make it into heaven. Ultimately, you do need to change your God. And you need to start worshiping Jesus and living his way. And that's far too much of an ask for the men of the Sanhedrin. And so they threaten Peter and John with legal action if they teach that there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we may be saved. Does that sound familiar? How contemporary is that? This is exactly what is happening in the Western world as we sit here this morning. There are many places in the world where you will face legal action if you teach that there is no other name under heaven by which people can be saved than the name of Jesus Christ. So what will Peter and John do? Well, look at verse 19 and 20. Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to listen to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And so Peter and John throw the hot potato straight back at the men who were throwing it at them. They put the ball firmly back in their court to the men who are sitting in judgment over them. You guys are all judges, says Peter. There's 70 of you, judges, sitting in judgment. So why don't you judge whether we should listen to you or listen to God? We're not going to lie about what we have seen and heard. Peter is not about to deny Jesus a false time. Jesus had said that his people would be his witnesses. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, that's what they're going to do, no matter the cost. Well, let me wrap up this morning. Friends, Jesus has given us the privilege of playing a part in people being saved. And God includes us in the incredible project of building an eternal kingdom for Jesus. And he does all of this through us being Jesus's witnesses. But he doesn't expect us to do this alone or in our own strength. And so he fills his people with his spirit. And it is by his spirit that he empowers and equips us to be his witnesses, to tell the world who Jesus is, and what he has done. We don't have to be heroes. We don't have to actually save anyone. All we need to do is be Jesus's witnesses, and he will use the words we speak to grow his church. That's all the apostles and the early Christians did. And in chapter two, we read that the Lord added about 3,000 Jewish converts to the church that day. And it didn't stop there, because later in the chapter, we read that the Lord continued to add to their number daily, those who were being saved. And in our passage today, we heard that the number of Jewish men, notice, who had become Christians, grew to about 5,000. In other words, it's now too hard to count the whole crowd, so we're just going to count the men. And they come to 5,000 plus women and children. And all because, all because the Holy Spirit gave the early Christians courage and conviction to be Jesus's witnesses. If you're a Christian here today, you have a story about Jesus that you can tell. It's your story, 
And so you're the expert. And there's someone out there who needs to hear your story. So tell your story about Jesus and what he has done for you. And watch what God will do. And if you haven't yet taken the name of Jesus to be your own, ask yourself what more God could have done to show you his love than to send his son, the Lord Jesus, to die in your place for your sins that first Good Friday. Let's pray together. Well, Heavenly Father, Jesus has called us to be his witnesses, but you know our fears and you know our failings. So please give us courage and conviction through your spirit who now lives in us. And Father, by that same spirit, will you work to convict and convince us of our need for your forgiveness? For we ask this, that Jesus may be exalted and glorified and that our friends and family might be saved. Amen.